Right, welcome back. Last time, we got invaded by Iberia. Yes, they invaded me. But obviously I won the war, because Manuka now has some of its territory back. Not all of it, mind you, but some of it. And I also grabbed these two provinces that I claimed, as well as this little island over here. Set of island over here. The Seychets. Not that the province itself was named Cecil. Yeah. Also done some more expansion, like uh, in Australia, in the hopes of trying to get a reasonably high trade value province somewhere inside of Oceania. And if Brazil ends up taking, continues to fail to generate a high value province, even after a long while, I'll probably, you know, after I'm finished with colonizing Australia, I'll probably start heading for Japan. So far, I don't see anyone doing anything here, but it's pretty much only a matter of time, isn't it? Oh, wait. Iberian Hokkaido. Yep. <sighs> Everywhere I go, I see your face. Why? <laughs> anyway, also finished up Standing Army Ideas. Got to start on Espionage Ideas because those are surprisingly good. Surprisingly so. And swap to Hybrid Military and Enlist. Yep, I've got a conscription system going, and my manpower has never been this good. My force limit is like... Yeah, it's 90 now. It's literally 90, so... I no longer have any manpower issues. With regards to military matters. Population? Economy? Yeah, that might be a different story. I also had a really poor succession. So now I've swapped a random dynasty and the ruler's mad, so... Uh, I hate monarchies for this very reason. Just one inconsistent succession, and the entire thing collapses. I'm going to avoid directly fighting their armies, because I'd rather ensure that they get a good peace with uh, Iberia. They, they might choose to do so sooner, if they lose their army, but I'm going to avoid fighting them directly and focus on sieging down provinces within the region. It's a hundred ducats for ten loyalty. That's ridiculously cheap. As far as my economy is concerned. It's also really cheap. Burning cash is perfectly fine by me. Though my income is rather inconsistent, thanks to provincial corruption and all that, I can still get quite a ways forward. Better if my Nika keeps out of control than myself. Ah, I guess I can send another colonist to that spot specifically. Make sure his things are connected up. I don't particularly like that. Really? Really? Can the province even be cored? Apparently, yes.
Okay, so uh, when does the recent reforms thing expire? There it is, okay. The 13th. This stuff expires 13th as well. Dang it, for it. Okay. Day was lost, not a big deal. Uh, there aren't any reforms that I actually want right now that I can do. Lowering the power of the gnomes a bit. Apparently, there's not much I can do to lower the power of the gnomes. At least not via the reform system. We via reforms and all that. Should probably just drop a few appointments. There. It will lower legitimacy and prestige gain, but it will heavily reduce corruption. What was the resting point by five, which is quite a bit. Considerable compared to all the other possibilities. Overlook tenant abuse, that's an easy one. Yield concession to ancient liberty, I don't really need that centralization gain anyway. My legitimacy is inconsistent, so I shouldn't touch that. Promote the aristocrat faction, that one's easy. Let's not arrange a strategic marriage. That's going to cost me too much. Right. It's going to cost me about 600 points. This will cost me 247. So I can take one espionage idea and still get the tech. Training! There are some tricks of the trade when it comes to espionage. Make eye contact. Don't make too much eye contact. Preferably, don't get seen at all. Spy Network Construction plus 20%, a Diplo Rep plus 2. Yeesh. Stuff like that is why I say it is ridiculously powerful at the Espionage Idea Group. Modern Lighthouses. Owned Coast Naval Combat Bonus plus 25%. Naval Attrition. No longer increased by staying out at sea each month. Trade Range plus 130. Enables a bunch of new ship types. New Transport. New Light Ship. The Four Field System. Rural goods produced plus 5% and allows another group of ideas, which will be industrial. I just need another admin tech. I need steam engine for that. And drop lock muskets. Dog lock muskets. Right. Cavalry fire plus 0.12. Artillery fire plus 0.8. Cavalry shock plus 0.2. Far, far more powerful weapons. Claim. Oh, Lee Lunder is a claim on the prowess. Which is a bit strange. Industrial ideas just generally are too good to miss, but it takes Admin Tech 51 to select it, so I'm waiting until then. I just hope we can get to global trade soon enough, because, well. I am having some issues. Uh, I could the prestige would be better. Although I should check my prestige gain. Yep, I'm losing prestige. Hungary is no longer a valid rival. Okay, I eclipsed them, correct? Yes. That gets me a little bit further ahead. The fact that they're no longer a valid rival is indicative of quite a few things. Uh, do I actually have any leftover unclaimed coins? Yes. Uncontested. Coins. None on here, but I don't need the core here, so. After all, this is my colony, and having cores on my colony's provinces, uh. That's a bit strange. To put it lightly. Oh yeah, actually, informants is a good idea to grab as early uh, as possible. Information is as powerful a weapon as any fire lit underneath a haystack. When your enemy believes you do not know that which you do, they are ripe for walking into a trap. Diplomats plus one. Not really 
useful now, but it was useful in the past. And yearly corruption minus 0.33. So the resting point for corruption is now 3.3 lower. Which is a lot for a singular idea. I think that's actually the single largest reduction to corruption you can get. Other than simply the resting point mechanic on its own. In fact, the resting point is now below 30. Not much below, mind you. It's like 39 point... 39.7 or 39.8 around that, but it's still rather low. Uh, anything I forgot here? No. Going to Unitary is actually pretty hard. Because Urban Governance 3 plus. And that was pretty much the direction I had to go for that. Which is rather annoying. Well, the province has a natural is a natural location for that sort of a thing. It doesn't naturally have any popu urban population to work with. So I want to do anything about this node. It's going to have to be in a different manner. Possibly. This province picked up an urban population, although I'm not sure if it already had one. Bring it up to rank 1 amenities at the least. At the very least. Oh, I do have 3.1 trade value now. Okay, so I don't need to do more expeditions over there. Well, that is fine by me. <laughs> so that's another continent I can mark off the list. Oh, and I've got Oceania too. Okay. Southeast Asia, Oceania. Wait. Wait a minute. If I remember correctly, Japan actually counts as part of the Pacific Islands, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so I got, um, so Japan fulfills the limits, the requirement for Oceania. Trat. I was hoping it would be otherwise, but I guess not. Well, I guess I'm going to need another southern India province. I remember doing that in the last campaign. Generally, going into India does not go over well. Usually because of issues. Issues galore. Trying to go to India is not easy, that's for sure. I mean, I could try and go after Lanka. There would certainly be enough trade value if I got a good province. So, I guess we're going after southern India now. I'm hoping things go reasonably well. Which they might not. Keep sending them to southern India. I'd like to slowly piece together more of a trade empire. And India is going to be... Southern India is going to be a, a very important part of that. It's part of the reason why I saved India for last, because I knew it would work fairly easily in the efforts of getting global trade. Probably should have gone to Japan sooner, but... Well, they can handle it. Ooh, the air is actually pretty good on skill. 
The claim could be way better, though. Honest. Well, hmm. Not terrible, but it could be better. Okay, he's got claims on two of those provinces. That's good enough. Imperialism gets his belly. You two can keep drilling. Unless something serious happens, I am not going to need your presences. Keep it simple, keep it. <laughs> I don't know why you're able to get access to Iberia, but I don't care. Which is going to be rather hard because, yeah, England actually has quite a bit of trade power despite not having a single province in the area. And why does France, why has France developed this to the point to having a center of power? Again, it is, it is the Central and South Africa subcontinent, which rarely sees much development. All that much development, so it's actually really easy to get centers there compared to other locations. Hmm. Maybe I should actually not take Diplotech until. Yeah, I'd probably be best. I do want Adam and Tech 51, though, so I can get started on. ideas, but I'll wait on the Diplotech until later. Right, the steam engine. Production efficiency, urban production efficiency, plus 2%. Pikes retired. Combat width, plus 2. Artillery shock, plus 0.1. Infantry fire, plus 0.1. Can now build the fortress. The maximum level fort. And I should be able to... Yep, industrial ideas. Combat ability buffs. Clan power just drops like a rock. Peasant labor supply up. Nearly peasant freedom. Okay, that one's not really that important. But moving speed based diversions up. Artillery fire buff. Oh boy. Oh boy. I may as well grab them now. The ideas. All of them that I want. Civilian involvement. Some people don't have to know anything about your plan to help you. Some people need only know who you seek to hurt. Others only need a little coin. Regardless of their reasons, their help is equally valuable. Elite power from autonomy, minus 10%. Cost of just like trade conflict, minus 20%. Last one isn't that useful. First one, though? Oh boy. Especially since I do have communication issues due to lack of infrastructure. Counter espionage. Only a fool believes their enemy is incapable of thinking as they do. It is, it is easy to forget that espionage is a dance between two players. Corruption from elites, minus 7.5%. Foreign spy detection, plus 20%. And if it's a finisher buff, rebel support efficiency, plus 50%. Right, time to go through industrial ideas. Winds of change. Seeds blown across the wind. Visions of change and turmoil. Of lives upended and terrible evil only destroyed at great cost. But also of sickness nearly banished of the world united like never before, and of those called poor living as kings. Change is coming. Let us hope we are not the status quo. Yearly peasant freedom plus one. Global institution spread plus 33%. Urbanization. From day-long labors to day-long shifts. Cruelties of the past forgotten, replaced by those of the present. Peasant labor supply plus 10%. So, each peasant now acts as if they were 10%. Well, 110% of the labor that they were previously, freeing up more population to go to the cities. Amenities cost, minus 10%. Urban production efficiency, plus 2.5%. Innocence, lost. There is no remaining behind. Change comes for even the most isolated, and like water against stone, even the most resilient of traditions shall be worn away. 
Elite diversions concern plus 50%, yearly clan power minus 0.5, and stability increase interval minus 7%. 7.5%. Entrepreneurs, in spirit like the explorers of yesteryear, seeking new paths to prosperity and risking much for the chance at greater fortune. However incidental to their motivations, they pave the way for a better life. Base consultation plus one, embargo efficiency plus 50%. Economies of scale. The benefits of fully utilizing the things you pay for are not to be understated. Cities are an expression of those benefits, the largest a marvel of efficiency over sparse cottages and distant amenities. Herb production efficiency plus 2.5%. Merchants of Death, the ugly face of prosperity that mighted permits. An ever escalating race of arms to end in peace everlasting or the doom of us all. Armaments and naval production plus 5%. Infantry and artillery combat ability plus 10%. Ship durability plus 10%. Brave New World. It is the most alien of worlds, the one of our own making. One of culture ever-changing, of children strangers to their own parents, and of fates uncertain. Peculiar and terrifying and beautiful all at once. It is into this world we step, never to return. Base diversions plus 1%, pathing infrastructure cost minus 10%, movement speed plus 5%. As a finisher bonus, artillery fire plus 0.25, and the police force is now available as a policy. Now it's more useful than the Currency Act. So, appeal, there we go. Stability increase interval minus 10%. Now it should be even easier to maintain a high stability. Right, with those ideas, it, sure, it certainly should be easier to get global trade, as well as nationalism and industrialization, once it is time for them to. I'll pick up the last Diplotech once I have global trade embraced. Yep. Yeah, this is a good point to stop for now. Alright, I've recovered from the reforms and my military continues to grow in size, which is rather ridiculous so far. I am also at the point where I could go ahead and grab free commerce if I wanted to, though I I don't really think that's the greatest of ideas. I don't really need to do it, and I already have enough trade power. If I would, I would want to go straight to corporate mode, which is actually something I can do once I have global trade. It would still allow me to get some commerce income off of them through taxation. Though not nearly as much, to be honest, I'd prefer just sticking to commercial law. For now, anyway. Maybe later I'll look into it, but for now, yeah. Right, ideas. I've elected to wait on grabbing a Diplotech in order to finish off espionage ideas. And I just blast it, you know, straight through industrial ideas, so I've got the entirety of it now. It's great. <laughs> it always is great. Industrial ideas are just really strong with a lot of varied buffs. That, especially the peasant labor supply one. That one's really good. In areas where there isn't enough peasant labor, suddenly there's a lot more available. among other things, so. And in areas where there's enough peasant labor, suddenly, peasants can start moving away. Cities or something. Yeah. I've... Well, apparently, I well, I did finish up my colonization of Australia and Papua as best as I could, although there's only so much I can do because I'm not the only one colonizing. I'm competing against other people too. I've also done some expeditions to Japan, which has gotten me pretty... F that's why. I'm gonna have to deal with that and that's gonna be annoying. Okay. Well, off you go. Yeah, for some reason, the Pretender Rebels from the recent 
um, happenings have cost some. They've spawned in Japan for some reason. I'm not entirely certain why, but they did. So that's something I'm going to have to deal with. Let's improve relations with you. Yeah. Stuff happened involving Mundu. Which is why I now have even more territory than the Matapa region. Though I do plan on going up against Iberia for even more territory. There we go. That should be perfect. Uh, I figure we're approaching the point where Iberia can start colonizing into these areas if they... with... you know... Because these inland African provinces can only be colonized by non-Africans once they have a certain level of technology. I'm not sure what that tech is, because I don't remember, but it is certainly a bit high, so... Yeah. But yeah, I was able to start getting global trade. Um, Japan apparently counts as part of the Pacific Islands, so I went to India and... yeah. I'm still trying to get more provinces, but it's surprisingly difficult to get a successful expedition. I'm not entirely sure why. Oh, uh, and Swahili Brazil started their own colonial war against Argentina. They grabbed these two provinces, these three provinces, which are still part of colonial Brazil, and then these five provinces, which aren't. They're part of colonial La, La Plata. So Uruguay and the Corrientes region, if I remember the name of this area correctly. Again, that's assuming I do. Calling these eight provinces Paraguay feels like it's kind of missing the point. <laughs> but okay. So yeah, that's actually six of the continents required. So I'm gaining... It's spreading. And it's spreading rather rapidly, though not in the areas you expect. Because for some reason, inside the Swahili node of Zanj... Oddly enough, it's Central Power Pile that has the most trade value. Kiwa barely has only 5.5, and Central Power barely has better. Whereas Bambik Swani has 8.4 compared to, you know, literally Central Power 6.2. So, yeah, funky stuff involving trade. Certain areas are just more productive than others, I guess. Still kind of an odd thought, though. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to embrace it in 1710 when the next tech comes around. I don't really need to be able to corrupt officials in Iberia constantly, so... <laughs> the thought is very amusing to me. There we go. I'm probably going to end up going to war against Iberia sooner. Kind of busy in a war against Mel over here. So... They're going to be a bit distracted, I guess. Especially since I actually have more troops than they do now. And I also have a higher force on them, because they're fully using their force potential, whereas I have 90k troops on the field, my total manpower is 270k, so I have, another, I have 180k left. Whereas there is about e their reserves are about equal to their s soldier count, so... That means they're at about force limit. So I can easily field 50% more troops than they can. <laughs> Not that I'm going to, because that's expensive, and I am slowly working through the massive treasury I've managed to build up. My income's not consistent because of corruption. And I'm trying to get around that, but there's only so much I can do, especially since bureaucratic influence has dropped because of random events, and there's only one thing I can do that has a requirement of 65 state reach. Because I'm going to need civil examinations 2, which requires 60 executive authority, which my current ruler doesn't have. I think my previous ruler did, but my current ruler definitely doesn't. The heir probably will be capable of it, I hope. But yeah. And I also need capital infrastructure 3, which I'm building in Morgadush. Hopefully it doesn't require it in the capital. Probably doesn't, because it specifies for the that I have to have at the capital a rank one capital. Which I do. 
I don't have the infrastructure construction capability for more because I'm currently busy trying to get amenities to rank four, you know, five here. And my urban population is almost, almost double the current cap. Which just goes to show how ridiculously good life is for my urbanites. Yeah. Mogadishu is at almost 100 dev. I'm not sure if that's the highest dev province in the world. I can check the ledger, I think. I'm fairly certain these are my provinces. Otherwise, I wouldn't be seeing so many Sunni provinces yet. It's probably the dev map mode if I want that. I mean, it's certainly green. A pretty bright green, although I figure... Sixty. Fifty-six, fifty-nine, sixty-eight, eighty-nine. That looks like to be the highest. Am I really... Do I really have the highest development province in the world? Possibly. Austria doesn't have that good development. Oxford, which for some reason is the capital of England rather than London, has 57. I may actually have the highest death province in the world. Huh. Noise. Kills at 77, so... The fact that my colors don't change at all is pretty indicative of me really having the highest type of problems in the world, so... Maybe I do, huh. I mean, there is potentially India, but... Well, India usually doesn't get quite as much dev as China does. 57, 53, 56. Yeah, I changed to greener. 44, yep. Uh-huh, yep. I'm certain Grixia's color shift. And that's the greenest province. Chongqing. With 89. So, yeah, it looks like it. Huh. Huh. Right. There isn't really anything else for me to say, so. I guess I'll see you again next time. Until then, bye. We'll finally have global trade.